Good evening. My name is Nancy Ridgway, and I would like to welcome all of you to R5 Productions presentation of H.G. Wells's The Time Machine, a radio play, performed live just as was done during the golden age of radio. It occurred to me during this time when we are all sequestered that theater can still go on, especially live theater. Before there was television, there were radio plays, actors assembled together on a stage or studio performing for a live audience. We've all seen pictures of families sitting together in the living room with the kids laying on the floor in front of the radio to hear this week's episode of The Shadow or Little Orphan Annie. Today, the 21st century version of a radio play can be found through a podcast or listening to a dramatization of a book through an online service such as Audible. Combining the golden age of radio with 21st century technology was the inspiration to tonight's event. So we have assembled a group of actors who will perform live via Zoom technology. I hope you enjoy our presentation. And if you're so inclined, hang around after the show for an introduction to the actors and a short talk back. Thank you for tuning in and stay tuned for our next radio play, which will be announced in the next month. My name is Philby, and perhaps that's all you need to know about me, except that I speak the truth. Three years ago, something quite extraordinary happened. It was, how shall I put it, a lesson about time. Yes, time. A most interesting, and for some, a very difficult concept. Imagine, if you will, that in the time it takes me to finish this sentence, we have moved into the future, and the words I have only just spoken are already in the past. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let my story be told as it happened. 
I, <laughs> gentlemen, I guarantee you this is well worthy. Who does he think he is? Gentlemen, gentlemen, all I'm asking you to do is question what you were taught in school. If you will follow me carefully, you'll see that every geometry lesson was wrong. Oh, why um, should no. we? Just absurd. I beg your pardon, John. Please. How can you say such a thing? Hear me out, Phil B. Let me explain. We're waiting. Yes. yes. Go yes. on. Go on. It's nearly 1900, a new century. And? And we're on the brink of an age of science. We can't afford to look at this new world in the old way. Why not? Mankind has been well served for thousands of years, if you ask me. We're not asking you. A new age huh. demands new thinking. What better place to start than when the physical nature of reality? Well, now we're back to something I understand. Well, look at this. What am I holding? A cube, plain to see. Yes, a cube. And I'll place it on this table. It is three dimensions. Height, width, and depth. But suppose we subtract one, say depth. Does the cube still exist? No. If it only has two dimensions, it would be a square. That's right, Philby. Take away a dimension and this cube is gone. Huh. So? Now, I want you to add a dimension. Add a dimension? Yes, add a dimension. I put it to you, gentlemen, that an object exists in four directions, not just three. It exists in duration. <laughs> In other words, time. Is that clear? <laughs> Very clear, John, I think. Nonsense. It's not clear at all. I can see if an object is tall or wide or deep. But as for its existence in time... Always being practical, aren't you, Samuel? Well, I can be practical, too. Here are photographs of a man at eight years old, another at 15, another at 23, and so on. These are examples of his travel through time. <laughs> you look skeptical, Colin. Do a man travels automatically, John. One travels through time regardless. Aging. Yes, but what if we could move faster or slower, forward or backward in time? I want to show you something. Oh. Oh. oh, what is that? What is that? <laughs> this oh. is my miniature prototype, gentlemen, for a machine that travels through time. Oh, no. It's beautifully time. made. No. It's like a toy. This is no toy, James. It took two years for me to make. Two years on that? That's right, Samuel. But what is time, eh? Oh, Philby, you never know when he's joking. If I press this tiny lever, I send the machine gliding into the future. Pull it back. And it goes into the past. This seat is where the time traveler will sit. Have a good look at it, gentlemen. Look at the table. Check for trap doors and mirrors. Satisfy yourselves that there is no trickery. I don't want to waste this model and then have you <laughs> tell me I'm a charlatan. Well, let's see now. Uh, <laughs> no mirrors. Uh, Seems fine. No mirrors. See any. Now, Samuel, since you are the most skeptical, lend me your hand. Whatever for. You shall press the ivory lever that launches my machine on its maiden journey through time. <laughs> Go on, Samuel, press it. Uh. <laughs> Go on. Oh, very well. What's it doing? It's glimmering. It's growing dim. But it's not moving. It's blurry. It's getting blurry. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. What have you done with it? Where is it, John? Yes, where did it go? Good heavens! <laughs> Come, John, where is it? Gone in time, Colin, and yet, right here. Do you mean to say that machine has traveled into the past? I doubt the past. Why? Uh, because if it traveled into the past, then it would already have been on this table when, when we arrived, arrived at John's house tonight. That's right, James. Have I made you a believer? If seeing is believing, you have. It'll take more than a magician's trick to convince me. You inspected the table, Samuel. You've invented some new method. That's I've all. invented something new, all right. Would you like to see the time machine itself? <laughs> what? Well, what? Are you serious? If we can. What are you saying, John? Have you built more of these toys? Not toys, Philby. A real one. No, it isn't possible. It is, and if you'll follow me, I'll show you. Of all the unbelievable... Follow me! 
and for the first time ever, John led us into his laboratory. There we beheld positioned in the middle of the room a larger version of the mechanism, alone and imposing, part nickel, part ivory, part rock crystal. A brass rail surrounded the contraption. In the flickering lamplight, the machine appeared to shimmer. You are serious. I was never more serious in my life, James. With this machine, I intend to explore time. On the following Thursday, we again gathered at our eccentric friend's home for supper. But instead of being greeted by our host, it was Mrs. Watchett, the housekeeper, who greeted Right on time, as always, gentlemen. Please come in. Oh, Hello, Mrs. Watchett. Huh? Hello, Mrs. How, Watchett. Watchett. How are you? Mr. Samuel, I have a letter for you, courtesy of himself. <laughs> and where is himself tonight, Mrs. Watchett? Well, if his letter doesn't tell you, I'm sure I have no idea. Really? His instructions to me were to have food on the table at seven, regardless. Well, then I suggest we move to the dining table and not disappoint him. Open the letter, Philby. Oh, yes, of course. The letter. Oh. Uh, dear friends, uh, it's from John, all right. Oh, if we assumed as much, read it out loud. Dear friends, image of there, you see me as an instructor. Uh, it just says he may be delayed. Uh, let me see that. Dear friends, I may be delayed this evening, but have instructed Mrs. Watchett to feed you promptly at seven o'clock. Do not wait for me. I shall arrive in good time. Well, <laughs> what do you make of that? Damnedest thing. Oh, let's eat. <laughs> Mrs. Watchett's dinner was, even by her own high standards, superb. What a pity our host wasn't there to enjoy it. Strange. But as tight-knit a group of friends as we were, John's absence was sorely missed. It was as though we required his company in order to function. And then... Holy <laughs> mother of Jesus! John! <laughs> it's John! Look at you! Where have you been, man? <sighs> you look ghastly. And your clothes. Give, give him a seat. <sighs> give him a drink. What on earth have you been up to, man? You, you've been injured. <sighs> sit, sit over here. <sighs> Say something. What's wrong with you? Speak. <sighs> Please, John, are, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right. Oh, not by medical standards, you're not. I, I, tr I truly am all right, Colin. Just let me have some food. I, I am starving for a bit of meat. One word, please. Have you been time traveling? Yes. What are you saying? Oh, my God. My God, man. Oh, man. Now I need a drink. I've just lived eight days, days such as no human being has ever lived before. Tell us, for God's sake. My yes, God. go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. It was at 10 o'clock this morning that my time machine and I began our career. This morning? Yes. But you just said you were gone eight days. Let him speak. That's right. At 10 o'clock this morning, I sat in the saddle of my time machine. I took the starting lever in one hand and nudged it forward. Almost at once, I, I felt a sensation of falling. So I immediately pulled back on the lever and stopped the machine. I looked at the clock on the wall. A moment before, it had said a minute past ten. Now, it was nearly half past three. It worked. I drew a breath, set my teeth, gripped the starting lever again with both hands, and off I went into time. <laughs> The visual sensation of time travel is unlike any other movement. I, I remained in one place. It, it was the laboratory around me that moved at increasing speed. <laughs> I was amused to see Mrs. Watch come into the room and walk toward the garden door, apparently without seeing me. I suppose it took her a minute or so, but to me, she seemed to shoot across the room like a rocket. <laughs> Feeling more assured of my device, I pushed the control lever still further. 
the night arrived like the turning out of a lamp, and in another moment came tomorrow. Soon day and night flickered rapidly like, like the flapping of a black wing. The laboratory grew fainter and fainter. Night, day, night, day, faster and faster still. Suddenly, I broke through into the open air. The flashing of day and night merged into one continuous gray. I saw trees grow like puffs of vapor. I saw huge structures built and raised, and I, I passed them like dreams. Soon I, be I began to ponder when and how I should stop. I pulled back on the lever as hard as I could. It felt as though I had snagged on some element in time and suddenly was flung headlong onto the ground. <laughs> My gauge showed that I was in the year 802,701 in a lush garden, getting drenched to the skin with warm rain. However, the most profound sensation was the sweet smell of flowers and clean earth. I rated my machine, saw no apparent damage, and looked about. A colossal stone figure like, like a great winged sphinx loomed above me. It stood on a bronze base, and its sightless eyes seemed to be watching. My attention was then drawn to the nearby bushes. <laughs> a group of young children had seen me. Hello there. Please, don't be afraid. I, I won't hurt you. It's all right to come out. One approached. He was perhaps four feet tall, wearing a purple tunic and sandals. But when I looked at him more closely, I realized he wasn't a child, but a fully grown man, yet indescribably frail. <laughs> hello? I say, hello? Hello? Do you speak English? What is your name? Hello. Name. Hello. What is this place? Oh, I have so much to ask you. Do you, do you understand me? Understand. They grasped my language almost as a child would struggle with new words. A and then they encircled me. Perhaps eight or ten of these exquisite creatures touching me with, with their soft hands. They wanted to make sure I was real. When I saw them moving toward my machine, I gently unscrewed the control lever and put it safely in my pocket. Where did you come from? Oh, dear God, you, you do understand. Did you come from the big noise in the sky? Big noise? You mean from the thunderstorm? Big noise from sky. Eloy's scared. A flow of disappointment rushed across my mind. I had always anticipated that the people of the future would be incredibly advanced. It had never occurred to me that that would not be the case. And Eloy came toward me carrying a garland of beautiful flowers and put it around my neck. I had become their new plaything. <laughs> They soon nudged me away from the garden, away from the Sphinx of Marble, and down the hill towards an even larger building a few hundred yards away. I was met at the doorway of this stone building by several more little people, all, all clad in bright, soft-colored robes. <laughs> Inside was a great hall. Along its length were tables made of polished stone upon which bowls of fruit had been placed. Some of the fruit I recognized, but for the most part, they were strange to me. My new friends seated themselves at the tables and motioned for me to do likewise. With complete absence of ceremony, they ate the fruit with their hands. I followed their example. As I ate, I surveyed the hall. What struck me was how dilapidated it looked. The stained glass windows were broken. The curtains were thick with dust. I asked the man sitting next to me, 
What was this place before it fell into ruin? It, it was always. Here is where the Eloi eat. The Eloi? We are Eloi. Are you not men and women? We are Eli. That is your name as a people. Surely you must have names among yourselves. What are names? How do you call to one another? Mindo. Mindo? Mindo is here. The one I was talking to smiled and pointed behind me. There stood the first Eloi I had met on my arrival. Mindo. Mindo. That is your name. Yes. My name is Mindo. My name is John. John. Mindo. Mindo. John. And where am I? You are here. You mean the name of this land. This land is Eli. It was frustrating, but I, I vowed to continue. Apparently, their world possessed all it needed to sustain physical life, yet their intellectual lives had atrophied. I had so many questions. Oh, so many questions. What is your work? Work. Work. Uh, labor. Toil. I don't understand. John, these people sound dolted. No, Philby. Simply, <laughs> simply exactly right. They knew nothing of labor, or anxiety, or war. The very food they ate was provided by nature's bounty. Fruit seemed to be the Eloi's only diet. What? No meat? No. None. Uh, strange indeed. Horses, cattle, sheep, and even dogs had apparently followed the dinosaur into extinction. I was distressed, to say the least, by the Eloi's almost complete lack of interest in acquiring knowledge. <laughs> the one exception was Mindo. If these people were at the intellectual level of our five-year-old, Mindo had the capacity of a boy of 10. It, it, they did not seem mentally unable to learn, just unused to it. Well, where did they live? What kind of houses did they inhabit? There were none to be seen. The single family dwellings, well, families themselves, had vanished. No families, husbands, wives. None that I could find. And then I asked him, Mindo, tell me something. Why are there no old Eloi? Do the older Eloi eat somewhere else? Old? Yes, old. People, that is, Eloi, who have lived many years. What is many years? Time. You are born, grow up, and then what happens when Eloi die? I do not understand. Die. What? How could I describe death? to a being that had no concept of life. Someone for whom one day is just like another until there are no more. Amazing. A profound anyway settled upon me. It seemed I had happened upon humanity on the wane. I was witnessing the twilight of mankind. As I mused over this irony, my eyes traveled to the figure of the Sphinx. I decided to get back to my machine. Like a lash across my face came the possibility of losing my own age, of, of being left helpless in this strange new world. A panic began to build, and I found myself running up the hill. When I reached the Sphinx, my worst fears were realized. My machine was gone. Not a trace of it was to be seen. I told myself it had only been moved somewhere by, by somebody I did not know. I must be calm and patient and... What of the pedestal? Exactly. But how? On the soft ground, I noticed two grooves made by the skids of my machine that led to the Sphinx. It took no great mental effort to infer that my time machine had been dragged into the pedestal. I banged with my fist at the bronze panels. I thought I heard something stir inside. To be explicit, I thought I heard a sound like a chuckle. <laughs> it was all so ludicrous. The years I had spent in study and toil to get into the future are now my eagerness to get out of it. Patience, I said to myself, patience. 
Next day, I was exploring the landscape around the Sphinx. I stumbled upon a peculiar feature. Circular wells of a great depth sunk into the ground. Peering into their darkness, I could see no gleam of water, nor could I see the bottom by dropping a lighted match. However, arising from all of them, from a depth too far to imagine, I heard a sound like some giant engine. I also discovered from the flaring of my matches a steady current of air flowing down the shafts. I, I wondered if this world, as pastoral as it was on the surface, was sitting atop an extensive network of subterranean caverns. And what of the little people? Were they of no help? Useless. They spent all their time playing. <laughs> I, however, was never far from thinking about my time machine. Something, I knew not what, had taken it into the hollow pedestal of the Sphinx. Why? Hmm. For the life of me, I could not imagine. The next day, I made a friend. As I was watching some of the little people bathing in a shallow part of the river, a girl was seized with cramps and began drifting downstream, drowning. Yet none of her friends made even the slightest attempt to rescue her. When I realized this, I, I hurriedly waded into the stream, caught the poor mite, and drew her safely to land. <laughs> Here now, you're, sa you're safe. I've got you. See? Back on dry land. You, you, you've just swallowed too much water. You'll be all right. Are you from the noise in the sky? Yes. What is your name? What? Oh, never mind. Weena. Weena. I'm John. John. That's right, John. And you're Weena. <laughs> that was the beginning of a friendship that lasted a week and ended, as I will tell you. It was from Weena I learned that fear had not left the world. She was brave enough in the daylight, but she dreaded the shadows of the night. After dark, I never found any Eloy out of doors. They always took refuge in the great house. One very hot morning, climbing among the heaps of ruined masonry behind the dining hall, I found a narrow passageway that extended underground. It was, at first, impenetrably dark, but I entered. I groped a few yards into the tunnel when suddenly I saw something at the far end. A pair of eyes, they were luminous, unblinking, without pupils, glowing at me from the darkness. I shouted, show yourself. What manner of creature are you? Come into the light. Don't be afraid. I, I haven't hurt any of you, have I? Hearing no response, I put out my hand. At once the eyes darted sideways and I glimpsed something white run past me. It was an ape-like thing with flaxen hair on its head and down its back. It gave me quite a fright. After I <clears throat> regained my composure, I followed it into the daylight, but it had vanished. I continued looking for it and soon came upon one of those bottomless shafts I had seen earlier. Could the creature have vanished down the shaft? I lit a match and looked down. There it was, scurrying down the middle rungs of a ladder. I don't know how long I peered down that well, for it took some time to persuade myself that the thing I had just seen was, in fact, human. Human? <laughs> Certainly not human. It was a creature. You said it was a creature. Hear me out, Philby. It was human. And that's the sad truth.
It dawned on me as I peered down that well that man had not remained one species, but had split into two distinct animals. My graceful Eloy, the children of the upper world, were not the sole descendants of our generation, but rather they shared the world with this hideous nocturnal human. It too was heir to the ages, and this second species of man was subterranean. What? Living in tunnels? Yes, right beneath my feet. I then began to wonder if these creatures were the reason that the Eloi could play and dine with such mindless abandon. Were these creatures perhaps the servants that provided comfort to the daylight race above? I had to find out, whatever the cost. That night, in the dining hall, Mindo, tell me something. Are the Eloi the only humans, the only ones like yourselves? The Eloi live under the sky. There are birds in the sky, and the Eloi are under it. What about other animals, uh, other things that live under the sky? Our food. The food is under the sky, and it is ours. And how does it get there? Do do the Eloi pick the food? It is there for us. It is under the sky, like the Eloi. Are there any living beings other than Eloi? There is just the Eloi. Really? This morning I saw, under the earth, far away from the sky, I saw a, a creature. Small and dark with bright eyes. Creature? Creature living far, far away from the sky. Is it Eloy? No, it lives below the earth, under the ground, in darkness. Darkness? Under the ground? Yes. Have you have you seen it? Eloy, do not see them. They are not Eloy. Them? There is more than one. Yes. There are many. But what are they? Do- do they do your bidding? Are, are they your servants, your slaves? Who, who are they? Morlocks! Morlocks! You don't run away! Who are the Morlocks? Morlocks, c- come in darkness. Now, just a moment, John. At first, you would have us believe you stumbled into the Garden of stumbled, Eden. Stumbled, yes, but, you- but the Garden of Eden? Far from it. What year is this? 802,701. Time travel alone is speculation. Now you're saying the human species has split into a race of puppies and a race of... of, Exactly. uh, Two separate human life forms. uh, Ridiculous. Hear me out. Today, in our society, We have those who work with their hands and those who work with their minds, as we are fond of saying. And unfortunately, there is a division between these two. I believe that gradually, this widening of the social gap between labor and capital, between the haves and the have-nots, increased until labor lost its place under the sun and went deeper deeper into ever larger underground factories. This gulf continued to expand until, in the end, the world was left with the haves, the Eloi, pursuing pleasure and comfort and beauty, while below were the have-nots, the workers, the Morlocks. The pleasures of the world above ground led the Eloi to become weak, small, and ignorant while below. The have-nots adapted to the confinement of their toil. In the years to come, the separation of labor and capital had become so acute, so institutionalized, that it altered the genetic makeup of the human race. Oh, no, no, it's not Major. possible. Major. God, what are you saying? Are you saying? <laughs> that night, I did not sleep very well. Once or twice, I had the feeling of intense fear. Perhaps I too should be afraid of the Morlocks. The next morning, I decided I would descend into the Morlocks domain. After all, they held my time machine. Little Weena ran after me, but when she saw me approach the shaft and began climbing in. No, 
the Morlocks. I shook her off and climbed down the tunnel. The thudding sound of heavy machines grew louder and more oppressive. When I looked up again toward the sky, Weena had disappeared. I continued my descent into the darkness. At the bottom of the shaft was a tunnel. I rested in the darkness for a moment, deciding what to do next. Suddenly, I felt soft hands touching my face. I grabbed for my matches, quickly striking one. This time I saw the creatures more clearly, living as they did in the impenetrable darkness. Their eyes were abnormally large and sensitive. They did not seem to have any fear of me uh, apart from the light. As I crawled along the passageway, I, I came upon an immense cavern. In the center of the cavern was a long metal table laid out with what seemed to be a meal. The food had the unmistakable glisten of meat. It was all so indistinct, the, the heavy smell of blood, the, the Morlocks lurking in the shadows, only waiting for the darkness to come at me again. Then my match went out. I dropped it, and there it lay, a glowing red spot in the recovering blackness. Oh, how ill-equipped I was in every aspect. I, I never started my journey on the absurd assumption that the men of the future would be infinitely advanced. Oh, how wrong I was. Suddenly, a hand brushed against mine. I heard breathing close to my face. <sighs> I felt the box of matches being taken out of my hand. I shouted as loudly as I could. I struck another match. I waved it in their eyes. You cannot imagine how nauseating they looked. Those pale, chinless faces and those great, lidless eyes. Panic overcame me and I, I ran back to the shaft. As I began to climb, I was violently tugged backward, kicking furiously. I, I freed myself from the clutches of the Morlocks and sped up the shaft while they remained behind, peering up at me. I staggered out into the sunlight. And Weena, was she gone? No, she, she had waited for me. She could hardly contain her joy at seeing me and spent much of the next hour putting flowers in my hair and in my pockets. We began our walk in the sunlight back to the great hall. However, with each step I fancied, I could feel the hollowness of the ground beneath my feet, could indeed almost see the Morlocks scurrying below. Weena's fatigue grew upon her, so I took her in my arms and she slept. As I felt her warmth against my body, I, I had a sudden realization. The meat I had seen in the cavern on the metal table was Eloy. No, it's not it could be. Be. Yes, I knew it now. There was a price to pay for their pleasures. It was obvious. The Eloy were the fatted cattle which the Morlocks slaughtered. The beasts of the field, as provided so generously in the Bible, had run their course. And the Morlocks were now eating the Eloy. Yes. Oh, no, what are you God. saying? God. No. We continued on. I decided to stop at the Palace of Green Porcelain. That great abandoned building hearkening to an equally abandoned age. The building material of the palace proved on examination to be indeed porcelain. And above the great door, I saw an inscription. Look, Weena, writing. Have you any idea what it says? Pretty designs. They're not just designs, Weena. Do you know what writing is? No. Writing is used for ideas. 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 Thoughts, abstractions, memories, history. Oh, Weena, have you any concept of the past? Of all the, the precious knowledge that has slipped away forever? Have you? What's the use? Inside the Palace of Green Porcelain, Weena led me to what might have been, in a time immemorial, a museum. I recognize the decaying vestiges of books. John. Weena, you, you used my name. 
Here, come. You come. Where? Pictures. Pictures. Come. Weena led me into a corridor beyond the main hall. There I saw row upon row of what looked like mirrors. As I got closer, however, I saw that they did not reflect my image, but rather they held an image of their own. And they spoke to me. With the enshrinement of knowledge came prosperity. Institutions fell not because they were toppled, but because they had fulfilled their purpose and yielded to the greater good. Prosperity? Knowledge? But when? Give me a date, damn it. When did these things happen? An ever-widening discrepancy between those who shape the world to their own needs and those whose world is shaped by others. When did the bifurcation begin? How long ago? With the terrible plagues, nation by nation, species by species, whatever power drove the playback machinery was suddenly cut off. A scuffling noise came from the far end of the hall. I found on the floor a stout iron rod, not unlike a crowbar. Oh, how I longed to kill a Morlock. Going up a staircase, we came to what must have been a gallery of technical chemistry. The gallery was well preserved, and in an unbroken case, I found a box of matches. Stand back, Weena. Here's a taste of what I'll give the Morlocks. In short order, the matches were mine. Very eagerly, I tried one. And they were perfectly good. Now with the crowbar and matches, I had weapons against the Morlocks. When we emerged from the palace, The sun was disappearing below the horizon. I was determined to reach the Sphinx by morning, but it was on the other side of the forest, as well as on the other side of the night. I lit a torch, and we continued on our way. As the darkness closed in, Morlocks! Morlocks! Hold on to me tight, Weena. I'll get us through this, trust me. It was time to relight the torch, but I had to let go of Weena to do so. I felt gnarled hands creep over my back and touch my neck. I spread a wad of camphor on the torch and lit it. I looked at Weena in the bright light. She was clutching my feet, quivering in terror. I lifted her to my shoulder and pushed on. However, I... Had turned myself around several times. Now I had not the faintest idea in what direction lay the Sphinx. Rather than wander deeper into the forest, I decided we should encamp where we were and build a fire. I began collecting sticks and leaves. Just beyond the edge of the torchlight, I could see the Morlock's eyes shining like cold, lifeless stones, waiting for their moment. Soon I had a raging fire. Weena was safe beside me, and the enemy was at bay. I looked at Weena in the flickering light and wondered what she would think once I brought her back to my time, back to civilization. Weena, tired. So am I, Weena. Rest. The Morlocks won't come near the fire. And so I sat with Weena in my arms, cradling her. I m must have closed my eyes for... For just a moment. When I felt rough hands on my face and I awoke with a start, I had fallen asleep and let the fire go out. I hastily reached for the matchbox in my pocket, but it was gone. The Morlocks were closing in. I grabbed Weena and we began to run desperately. <laughs> I danced off a tree as the branches tearing at our eyes, but the Morlocks had no trouble seeing us, and they chased us relentlessly. Exhausted, I finally had to take a stand. With my crowbar in hand, I fought off the human rats. I could feel the crunching of flesh and bone. I, I knew that both Weena and I were lost if I tired, but I was determined to make the Morlocks pay for their meat. I stood with my back against a tree, my club at the ready. Then... Suddenly, I, I saw an amazing thing, and with it came hope. The darkness seemed to grow 
luminous. Very dimly, I, I began to see the shapes of the Morlocks about me. I then saw little red sparks drifting between the branches. The forest was ablaze. Morlocks covering their eyes were running madly through the woods. Somehow an old spark and an ember from my fire had set the woods aflame. We were saved. I turned to Weena, but she was nowhere to be seen. I searched in vain. The, the whole forest was now burning. I, I watched as some 30 or 40 Morlocks, dazzled by the light and burned by the flames, blundered against each other in their bewilderment. Angrily, I, I rushed toward them, my crowbar swinging. But when I reached them groping uh, against the red sky and heard their moans, I, I realized their misery and I attacked no more. What happened to Weena? Did you find her? No, although I continued to search well into the morning. I'm so sorry, my friend. Eloy, Morlocks, cannibalism? What a depressing future you lay out for us. How did you get back? I made my way to the Great Sphinx. As I approached the pedestal, to my amazement, I found the bronze doors open. Inside, on a raised platform in the corner, was the time machine. I examined it and found to my surprise that it had been carefully oiled and cleaned. As I was pondering my good fortune, the bronze doors clanged shut. I was trapped. Or so the Morlocks thought. One touched me. I made a sweeping blow and scrambled into the saddle of my machine, trying to fit the lever into the control slots. Then came another hand, and another, and another, but at last... The lever was fixed, and I pushed it over. The clinging hands fell away as my machine gained speed. I was now careening headlong into the future. As I traveled on, a peculiar change crept over the appearance of things. Things were changing. The blinking succession of day and night grew slower until it seemed to stretch into centuries. At last, a steady twilight brooded over the earth, a twilight only broken now and then when a comet streaked across the darkening sky. I perceived that the earth, now hundreds of millions of years from now, had come to rest with one face toward the sun. Very cautiously, I began to slow down and until the thousands of passing years seemed motionless, until the dim outlines of a beach grew visible. I stopped very gently. The sky was no longer blue, but rather a deep Indian red and starless. The sparse vegetation looked like moss. There was a sense of oppression in my head and I noticed that I was breathing very fast as one would do when mountaineering. From that, I judged the air to be far thinner than it is now. Far away, I, I heard a harsh scream <laughs> and saw a thing like a huge butterfly disappear over some low hills. The sound of its voice was so dismal that I shivered. Looking round me again, I saw that what I had taken to be a reddish mass of rock was moving slowly towards me. It was a monstrous crab-like creature. As I stared at the sinister thing, I, I, I felt a tickling on my cheek. I turned and saw the antenna of another monster crab that stood just behind me. I moved on. I cannot convey the sense of desolation that hung over the world. A thousand years into the future, and there was the same red sun, a little larger, a little duller, and the same dying sea, the same chill air. And so I traveled, stopping ever and again, in great strides drawn on by the mystery of the Earth's fate. I watched with strange fascination 
the life of the earth ebb away. At last, more than 130 million years hence, the huge red hot dome of the sun had come to obscure nearly a tenth part of the darkening heavens. I decided to stop once more. The outline of the sun began to change. I realized that an eclipse was beginning. The darkness grew apace. A cold wind began to blow. From the edge of the sea came a ripple and a whisper. Beyond these lifeless sounds, the world was silent. Silent? It would be hard to convey the stillness of it. One by one, the distant peaks vanished into blackness. The shadow of the eclipse crept towards me, and the sky was absolutely black. A horror came upon me, and so I traveled back, back into the past. As I sped back to our time, the, the blinking succession of days and nights resumed. The sun got golden again, the sky blue. I breathed with greater freedom. Presently, when the million dial was at zero, I slackened speed. I began to recognize our own familiar architecture. The hands of my gauge spun back to the starting point. The walls of my laboratory came around me again. Very gently now, I slowed the mechanism down and stopped. For several minutes, I, I trembled violently. Presently, I, I got up and came into this room. And <clears throat> you, uh, you know the rest. <clears throat> it's getting late, perhaps. <clears throat> uh, well, say something, for God's sake. What do you want us to say? Take it as a lie or, or a prophecy. Say, say I dreamed it in the workshop, but say something. Samuel, you're always the most skeptical. Well? <laughs> what a pity it is. You're not a writer. James, are you more convinced than Samuel? If you say so. You don't believe it. Well, I, I believe that you believe it. To tell you the truth, I hardly believe it myself. And yet... W wait. <laughs> Look. Look at these flowers. Colin. Let me see. Rena gave them to me. Re remember? She, she put them in my pockets. Oh, they're unusual. Very unusual. I don't believe I've ever seen specimens like them. I would lay odds that you never will. They are a gift from the future. Would you mind if I took them with me to study? I would very much mind. They're all I have of her. Well, it's getting late. <laughs> well, I'll be hanged if it isn't midnight. The, the trains have stopped running. There'll be plenty of cabs at the station. Oh, of course. Well, well in any case, I, I really must go. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mrs. Watchin. Wonderful dinner. You're quite welcome. Is everyone leaving? Well, yes, it, it is time to go. Yes, good night, gentlemen. Good night. Mind the good night. front steps. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Philby. I think I'll wait a minute. I, I want to speak with John. Well, good yes. night then. Good night. Yes, good night. Good Goodbye, night. Mrs. Ratchet. Yes. Will you, be, will you be needing me anymore tonight, sir? No, Mrs. Ratchet. I suspect Mr. Philby has a few more questions to ask me in, in private. I'll see to the downstairs. Well, good night then. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Ratchet. The flowers, John. Tell me again, where did you get them? I told you. They were put into my pocket by Weena when, when I traveled into time. Yes. You miss her terribly. Yes. And, and yet, as I stare around this room, I wonder, did, did I ever know her? Did I ever make a time machine or even the model of a time machine? I saw them both with mine own eyes. And they did seem real. But right now, I'm more concerned about your health. They say life is a dream, Philby. A precious, poor dream at times. But where did that dream come from? Wait, I must see something. Where are you going? John! John, where are you going? To my machine. I must see it again. Outside without a coat? It's the dead of winter. Bring a lantern and come with me. This is madness. Sheer madness. I followed the time traveler outside. 
There in the flickering light was the time machine. For all its travails, it was still solid to the touch. For I put out my hand and felt the rail. I saw brown smears upon the ivory and bits of grass and moss upon the lower parts, and one rail bent awry. The time traveler put the lamp down and ran his hand along the damaged rail. I'm all right now. I, I just needed to see it. The, the story is true. It's true. I knew that for sure. I'm <clears throat> sorry to have brought you out here in the cold. Not at all. But let's leave it at that. You can attend to it tomorrow. After all, you have the time. Your sure, words were never spoken, Philby. Good night. Good night. Get some sleep. I left the house, barely able to make sense of my thoughts. The story was so fantastic, so incredible. I lay awake most of the night thinking about it. I went the next day to see the time traveler again. Mrs. Watchett told me he was in the laboratory. The laboratory, however, was empty. I stared for a moment at the time machine. I put out my hand and touched the lever. Just the barest touch, you understand. Even so, the device swayed like a bow shaken by the wind. <laughs> I had a memory of my childhood days when I used to be warned not to meddle. I came back into the house and found the time traveler in the smoking room. He looked as though he had slept as badly as I. He had a small camera under one arm and a knapsack under the other. John. Sorry, no time to visit. I'm awfully busy. Tell me the truth. Is it a hoax or do you really travel through time? Really and truly, I do, Philby. Just give me half an hour and I'll prove it to you. Can you give me that? Can you give me half an hour? Of course, of course I can. I have the time. Thank you for coming <laughs> back. You're a good friend, Philby. He went down the hall with his knapsack and camera. I heard the door of the laboratory close and I took up the daily paper to wait. What was he going to do before lunchtime? Then suddenly I remembered I had promised to meet my publisher. I looked at my watch and saw I could barely make the appointment. So I got up and went down the hall to tell the time traveler. As I opened the door, a gust of air whirled round me. From within came the sound of broken glass falling on the floor. But the time traveler was not there. Not really. What I saw was a ghostly, indistinct figure sitting in a whirling mass of light. A figure so transparent that the bench behind with its sheets of drawings was absolutely distinct. Then the time traveler and his machine were gone. At that moment, I understood. I believed. At the risk of disappointing my publisher, I stayed on, waiting for the time traveler, waiting for his next, perhaps even stranger story and the specimens and photographs he would bring back with him. But the time traveler vanished three years ago and as everybody knows, he has not yet returned. I now fear I shall wait a lifetime. As my only comfort, I keep on my desk beside me two strange white flowers, brown and flat and shriveled to remind me that in the distant future, even when mind and strength had gone, gratitude and mutual tenderness still lived on in the heart of man.
everybody. Thank you so much for joining tonight. If you'd like to submit a question or just let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, on Monday night's performance, we have people from all over the country listening in, and I'd love to hear where everyone's uh, tuning in from. But at this time, what I'd like to do uh, is introduce our cast. As you know, this was a live performance, so we're all at our own homes and uh, doing this via Zoom. So I'd like to introduce, uh, first of all, myself. I'm Nancy Ridgway. I was the director of the show. Um, I have with me tonight, Jim McIntosh, who is amazing sound and visual designer. Jim, you did an amazing job. I can't get over how well this has all come together. Uh, Lee Stover, who played, the, who voiced the part of James and Mindo. Uh, Paul Waldowski, he did the voice of Colin. Sheldon <clears throat> Deff, who uh, voiced Samuel. Meg Waldowski was our Mrs. Watchett. Stephanie Rogers voiced Weena, and Brian Kelly was the voice of Philby. And last but not least, Rob Rosello, who voiced the John the Time Traveler. Thank you guys, great job tonight. Um, so I would like to pose a question and uh, I'd like to ask uh, Stephanie, like what, you know, why were you interested in uh, being a part of this show? Well, it's so fun to do something that involves any kind of acting right now. And this is something different that I think a lot of us don't normally get to do. But the really amazing thing was that when you're just acting with your voice, you can really be anything. And I thought it was so fun for me to play a character that I would probably never get cast as <laughs> in real life. And just really go for it with your voice and not be inhibited at all and and truly become something so different and otherworldly that again you know when would i get to play an alien from the future so sure <laughs> so, fun. so fun i loved it i loved it so we have people from maryland um oh. and one of the questions we have is uh from don doherty and he said how did you all rehearse this we rehearsed it via zoom call uh two nights a week for I think the past six weeks, and then the last couple of weeks, we did it three nights, but most of it was trying to tech it, trying mm. to get the sound and the audio and the video all worked out. But yeah, we just did it through Zoom. We never we never got together. We're still not together. We're all just still doing it from home. Yep. So, yep. Um, let's see, we have another question. Oh. Uh, Declan Smith said, Wahoo, yay, Weena. <laughs> <laughs> How much did you pay him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you got a fan upstairs. <laughs> um, lots of well wishers here. So, Jim McIntosh, talk, tell the, the audience a little bit about the technical challenges of doing this. Yeah, so part of it was as we were putting this together and coming up with the radio play idea itself. It was kind of giving a, a visual image to it also. We're in modern times with modern uh, technology. So we were really trying to see how far we could push the technology itself. And obviously we ran into some technical issues. Um, one of them being just the microphones itself, how, how sound is picked up through Zoom or really any of these uh, platforms. Um, it goes to the loudest speaking person. So we really had to start working on balancing and the actors working together and making sure they weren't stepping on top of each other. But even with the sound effects, we had the idea of sound effects and they were layered in behind quite a bit. But what we found out was with the sound effects underneath and an actor speaking on top of it, you'd start to get a warble as the two sounds tried to take over. So we had to make some adjustments and, and cut down on the sound effects, or I should say the length of the sound effects, right. so that you were put in the place, but the actors wouldn't be interrupted and you, you'd be able to hear the words clearly. Right. So some of the challenges, uh, I'd say the biggest challenges had to be the sound effects uh, and the, the microphones themselves. Right, because the sound effects are acting like another participant. So they were sort of battling with the actors as they would talk. So that's why it's kind of done that way. Yes. Uh, so Kim Rosman, our good friend, asks, uh, did Jim compose the music specifically for this play? Yes, he did. Well done. Yeah. Hey, thank, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, yes. Na as Nancy and I were talking, she's like, oh, we got to get music for this show. And, and I don't know, something in my head just made me say, you know, I think I'm going to compose something. Mm -hmm. So this was the first time for me to actually score a show a score you know write this kind of music because as you can see from my wall usually it's 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 more rock 
Uh, but this was the first time of me composing something like this. And I believe this has now changed my destiny. And I'm going to be starting <laughs> writing more of this uh, this type of music. I, I really enjoyed it. And it just it just started flowing out of me and it came together very quickly. So thank you for the question. Yeah, it worked perfectly. Uh, Jennifer Cole is asking, why did you choose the time machine for this? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I was looking for something to do um, online and I thought radio plays and uh, one of the licensing houses that I was scrolling through came up with a whole list of them and the time machine just sort of, uh, you know, just sort of piqued my interest. I've always loved this movie from 1960 and I just decided that that was it. That was the one we were going to do. Um, so our next question is, uh, what's up next? Possibly War of the Worlds. Well, we <laughs> <laughs> who said that? Who said, who said, who said that? that? Yes. So many people have said that to me too. That stay would be tuned. so great. Stay tuned. So, stay tuned, everybody. Um, we are we are going to come up with something. We just haven't quite decided what it's going to be, but um, we are planning our next uh, performance will be around Halloween time. So it probably be something that'll be good for that time of year. Um, so. Um, Matthew Kelly said, Philby was awesome, says Jack. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jack. <laughs> Kelly, 20, yeah, that's interesting. Similar, you, similar you know, last name. 20, 20 bucks on the way, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, anybody else have anything they would like to talk about? Or, um, so I don't know, you know. I don't want to keep everybody around too much longer, but. Anyway. Well, my daughter just asked a very interesting question. Did, Did you mm. find it more challenging to do the performance virtually versus in person actors? Mm. Question mark. So Rob, what do you think? I think it was just as challenging doing it uh, virtually as being in person to what Stephanie said. I, I found myself acting things out as I was doing it and it just sort of up freed me very much. What Stephanie said, it freed me, um, to try new things. And I, I've i worked with all the actors in this cast in some capacity um, over the past few years. So I have something of a relationship, but it was still a challenge not being able to look at them directly um, and just play off of their emotion and their voices. But it was a lot of fun. And I, I'm really glad I had this experience. I'm hopefully looking forward to more. Well, I can tell you as the director, and I've directed you in numerous um, productions, that this is the only production that you got to, you know, talk into a bucket on your head. True. <laughs> oh. Yes, that is true. <laughs> You're giving away secrets, Nancy. Yes. I know. It is freeing, though. I, I think I, I have to agree. It is very freeing for you guys to, you don't have to worry about how you look or um, walking across to get the blocking right or anything like that, you can kind of just sit back, relax, and, and kind of just let yourself go. And, and um, you don't have to worry about all those other, you know, kind of things. I am sure that performing live is still the thing that you all like to do the most. And I know for me, I like to, you know, direct a live, you know, uh, on stage. But this I find very, this was more, a lot more challenging than I thought it was going to be um for a number of reasons but i i thoroughly enjoyed it i'm really looking forward to doing doing our next production so i also think as an actor it really hones your listening skills mm -hmm. oh major for sure definitely it sounds so obvious but when you're on stage and you're i mean you're very focused on yourself and where you're moving and what your lines mm -hmm. are and you're blocking this, I thought it was really great where I was focused on listening to everybody mm -hmm. so that I knew my cue. And to Rob's point, that was freeing, but it's also a totally different kind of energy. So I feel like, you know, I, I gained something, a, a skill that I could probably, you know, do better at. It, I thought that was really great. I think piggybacking on that also is the fact that the technology is so new to this that we know there's a delay here and there and you have to and one of the things we did rehearse was making sure that one word ended from one character to get into the next mm -hmm. bit of business right. so it's um it's a it's a different mindset where you're used to having body language you're used to having mm -hmm. pauses you're used to having you know some type of take mm -hmm. and you know whether it's visual or 
an emotion and now it's a whole different animal and it's it's really interesting dynamic so we have a question from bill sutherland and he said who wrote the adaptation and how close is it to the original novel so this is adapted by john delancey from a script by nate siegeloff um and it is based on the original story uh, you know it's very close i have to say i think they did an excellent mm -hmm. adaptation yeah agreed yeah so mm -hmm. thanks for that question everybody well, it is now um, 8.40, um, unless anybody else has anything else I'd like to say, and any of our listeners will have another question, we can leave it open for a question for another minute or so, and then um, <laughs> hearing none, okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you to our audience for uh, joining in. We have had so much fun doing this, and stay tuned for more from R5 Productions, um, and uh, you know, we'll let you know when our next event is up. Thanks again, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night. Yeah.